This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. Today on the James Altucher Show. What a fun conversation. Now, Jim Rickards, you should be warned, he knows a lot. He is very good at explaining what he knows, and he's very pessimistic on current prospects with inflation, the economy, and perhaps the markets. I'm a bit more optimistic, but you'll see. I learned a lot in this conversation, and although I think there are more modern innovations than modern plumbing, Jim did school me on quite a few things, and so I learned a lot, and and you get to decide for yourself whether optimism or pessimism rules the day. My wife makes uh, fun of me, say, when things are fine, everyone loses my number. And then when the wheels come off, the phone doesn't stop ringing. So right now I'm busier than ever. So, <laughs> Yeah, because, you know, I think it's just a phenomenon of the markets that when the markets are going up, everybody is individually a genius. But when the markets yeah. are going down, the people who are geniuses are the ones who are pessimists or correctly or incorrectly. So there's a lot of people who have good data uh, when the market's down and make good predictions. But it's funny when the markets are going up, people lose my number. And when the markets are going down, people laugh at me. Yeah. I mean, during Trump, all you do is buy a passive index fund and sit back and you know enjoy the ride. So, uh, but now you actually have to think about what you're doing. Well, what was happening in the economy? Like, you know, the markets went up during the Obama years, obviously, but they were like hyper accelerated during the Trump years. And part of it, of course, was that half of his administration or part of his administration was under COVID. So that there was this stimulus package, but what else was going on then? Well, you know, if you look at the data, I'm sure you do, uh, GDP growth in the Trump years was not different than Obama. I mean, the whole period from 2000, now COVID was different. So you got to put 2020 in a separate category, but 2009 to 2019, which includes all of Obama practically, and then three out of four years of Trump, average growth was uh, 2.2% per annum. And it, it didn't deviate a lot from that. Trump had, I don't think they had one year or 3%. It, it was, you know, 2.9, maybe three, one year, a couple, actually a couple quarters, not even a whole year. So it, it it just stayed in that range, but there wasn't a lot of variation around the range. It was like, you know, one year might be 1.9 and 2.3. But that was just 2.2 for, for 12 years for both administrations. So the, the idea of the booming economy under Trump it was not true, but the stock market went up a lot. That that was true. So that, but that in my view was a bubble dynamic. Uh, and we all know how bubbles end, but they, uh, the thing about bubbles, they can go on longer than you think. I mean, they, you, everyone says, you know, the Fed, or I should say everyone, the Fed says they don't try to pop bubbles because they can never be sure if it's a bubble or just a good, strong market and they don't want to be responsible for it. They, you know, this is the Greenspan theory, but it goes all the way back to 1929. They said, we, we'd rather let bubbles take their course and clean up the mess then try to pop them and maybe cause a new Great Depression. So, uh, but to me, bubbles are the easiest thing to spot. Just look at a chart. I mean, you know, a Nikkei in 1989, a NASDAQ in 1999, um, dare I say Bitcoin, et cetera. So you can see bubbles a mile away, but, but and you can be sure they're going to break and you can be sure they're going to go down 70, 80%. What you're not sure of is when they pop. That, that's hard to tell. And I certainly wouldn't short a bubble because you can lose a lot of money being right. But uh, but they do pop and they go down and that that's that part's uh, pretty predictable. So uh, we haven't, uh, this this uh, break is a little different. I mean, the NASDAQ, I was like, oh, it's been going down since May. Well, actually the break started in November, uh, November, 2021. November uh, was kind of the, the high point for like every market. I'm curious, was there was there a PE multiple expansion from 2009 to now? There was uh, through uh, through 2020. It's been leveled off a little bit, but that's also bogus because, yeah, there was a PE expansion, but, but you know, it's price earnings, but what's your E? In other words, are you looking at like a shiller cape ratio or are you looking at Wall Street? Because Wall Street does um, expected earnings. They projected earnings. Right. And I think I think the earnings are in for a huge correction this year, meaning, yeah, you've got a PE ratio, but, but by inflating the E, you get like a ratio that doesn't look too bad. But if you correct the E for what's actually going to happen, the ratios are off the charts. That's the benefit of, of Schiller's ratio. It's 
it's backward looking, but it goes with 10 years, you're, you're going through at least one, maybe two, two and a half business cycles. And that's why it's a more meaningful number. Yeah. Also, the other thing that's interesting is when, if you kind of adjust for the increase in the money supply, the stock market has barely, hasn't moved since 2020, actually. Like if you would, if you normalize, like if you say, okay, the money supply increased 40%, guess what? So did the stock market. The stock market just like there was a just additional money in the economy because of all the bailouts and COVID, and that kind of went into the stock market. Yeah, until uh, late 2021, there wasn't much inflation. I mean, the, the stuff in your money, your money printing leads to inflation is nonsense. They, they actually have very little to do with each other because of velocity, which is a separate uh, variable, a separate factor. But the money goes somewhere. And it was not going into inflation, but it was going into assets. You saw it in real estate and stocks. Uh, so now that's deflating, but we have, we have inflation. We have everyday inflation. To I mean, the, the ideal is if it goes into industry. So like if, if, if money fuels innovations, which to some extent it did, I mean, there's been innovations in biotech, technology, genomics, you know, automated vehicles, all these things. But what always bothers me about the market, and and again, I'm in general an optimist. I own stocks. I believe in good companies. But what always bothers me about the market is that in the very beginning of when a company goes public, the entire reason it goes public is largely a scam. Like the venture capitalists have funded it all the way up, and now they just need to cash out. And so yeah. they have to, they can't, they can't send it to other venture capitalists because they're like, hey, why don't you invest in it? But we we don't want to take your garbage. But you know who will take it is the public. So an That's initial right. public offering is the venture capitalist saying, hey, the greater fool is Main Street America. So let's get rid of this piece of garbage that we have and uh uh, uh move on. Yeah, I think there's a lot of truth in that. I'm not I, I uh yeah, look, there's some innovation and some great technology going on. I'm I'm not sure. Uh, I agree that uh, even to the extent money has been available, it's been routed to really productive things. You know, the, the last great innovations were things like, you know, indoor plumbing, um, uh, you know, uh, electricity. The internet is a big innovation. Okay, I'll give, I'll give the internet a little credit, but that's about it. But, you know, the electric vehicle was invented in 1837. Uh, in 1905, 90% of the taxis in New York were electric vehicles. In the 1950s, 100% of the East German Postal Service were electric vehicles. They're basically golf carts. But uh, there's a reason they never caught on. And the reason is batteries. Uh, it's, yeah. it's, like, it's, that, it's that simple. An electric engine is very simple, high maintenance, it accelerates really fast, uh, has a lot of things going for it. Uh, but you remember like a 19th century locomotive, there was a coal car behind it and you shovel the coal in to keep the engine going. You should have one of those. Uh, you might it. remember that from your childhood. I don't quite remember well, that. My, my family are four generations on the railroad. So I know I know uh, a little bit about trains, but that's one of the reasons I loved uh, Atlas Shrugged. I thought it was a good uh, railroad yeah. story. But um, but that's what a Tesla should have because I was like plugging their Tesla into the grid like the electricity is coming out of the sky it's coming from coal burning plants 55 percent of the electricity in china is from coal that number is increasing they're the largest user of electronic vehicles uh and if it's not coal it's like oil or natural gas so the the idea that you have an emission-free vehicle no because you're charging it with electricity that comes from plants that emit co2 and we actually need a little more co2 by the way we're gonna we're gonna kill the plants at the rate we're going we, we should probably expand our co2 emissions but um but the but the electric cars, I mean, they work. I'm not saying you can't get around to one. Of course you can. But at the end of the day, the greatest fuel or the greatest energy generating capacity by weight, other than uranium, is gasoline, a gasoline or, or kerosene, which is, which is jet fuel. So you can get power out of a battery. My, I have actually owned and built the largest non-commercial off-grid solar field in New England. Really? So yeah, so I can say Greta and I have 75 acres of trees. So Greta Thunberg has nothing on me. So let, let me ask, can I ask you a couple of questions? So where, where are your solar panels? Are they are on the ground or on a-, a, a they're, on, they're, they're on the ground. Um, and uh, I had to clear three acres and I get all these nuts and go, oh, why do you have to clear three acres to put up solar panels? I said, well, uh, I don't live in the desert. We have trees. I, you know, I don't want a tree to fall on my solar panels, but I have, a, I have nine steel towers. They're- uh, 15 by nine feet each. Uh, each one has uh, uh, nine, you know, three by five solar panels on it. So, um, and, and how much can you store up if you wanted to store? 
Well, it all depends how many batteries you buy, but the batteries are very expensive. So I, um, it, it's a 7.5 kilowatt hours of output. I, I, I run one house on it. Now it's a, a decent sized house, but still one house. So it's like, um, and uh, I know a few, I learned a few things. Number one, they don't work at night. Uh, they don't work in the rain and the snow. In the winter, they don't work so well. Well, it depends on the depends on the weather, but uh, I get about um, everyone says oh, you run your house on solar power. It's like no, I run my house on batteries, and the batteries are charged by the solar panels. That's how it works. But uh, I get about three days if um, you know. But it, it, it's that's what that's what I hear that you can't. Uh, I have a neighbor who's all solar paneled, and uh, he gets about three days he could store. Yeah, you you actually uh, it's interesting because uh, humans are very adaptable. You adapt your lifestyle, so. On a sunny day, it's use it or lose it. I get more power than I can use. So that's the day, you know, washing machine, dishwasher, dryer, uh, you know, all you know, all that stuff. Run all that stuff on a sunny day. And you, you want on net, you won't use any electricity because you're generating more than you're using. But you know, solar energy is something that where there's innovation. I mean, every year so solar panel efficiency goes up by a factor of four. It's like one of these exponentially growing. There's a variety of exponentially growing industries. Solar panel industry is one of them, and that's where there's some some innovation. Yeah, there's some. Like I say, I I, I own one, but um, uh, it's not. It's really not scalable. Uh, there is right. there is innovation, and you can't run a grid on it because it's intermittent for exactly the reasons I mentioned. Uh, in other words, I, I've I've got a lot of batteries. I've got twenty large. Um, uh, they're made by Sony. You know, they're they're top line. I don't have any Chinese parts anywhere. My panels are from Canada. My batteries are from Japan. Uh, all the the work was obviously a local labor. Um, but I, I avoid China, you know, to the, to the greatest extent possible. It's impossible to avoid it completely. But I try not to buy any Chinese parts. But uh, no, it works great. Uh, I'm not. I'm. I'm a. I'm a fan. I'm also an expert because I build it. Uh, but my point being, you cannot run a power grid on it. It's it's intermittent yeah, power. Right. It's a supplement. It's a supplement. It'll play a role. It'll grow. I agree with that. But uh, sorry, we're on oil, natural gas, whether you like it or not. Period. Yeah, and and but you know, just to the point of innovation, wouldn't you say there's also been innovation in genomics, like gene editing, things like that? Like, and that's another exponentially growing industry. Which you know, 10, 15 years from now, if it keeps growing at the rate it's growing like major diseases that people thought were hopeless to solve are going to be solved. Maybe, maybe not. I mean, it depends how. So for example, these, uh, you know, Pfizer Moderna vaccine, I mean, they're not really vaccines. They're, they're experimental gene modification treatments. Uh, they don't work. You know, 5 million people, in December, 2021, I follow this closely. I wrote a book on it actually, but uh, in, in December, 2021, 5 million people who were double vaxxed and boosted got Omicron. So I said, I wrote my book in 2020. I said, the, the vaccines don't work, but how much more proof do you need? 5 million double vax boosted people got Omicron. It pro obviously proves, but we knew already that it doesn't stop infection and it doesn't stop spread. They do um, reduce or mitigate uh, extreme symptoms in, extreme, in highly vulnerable individuals. So if you're 70 years old and you're obese, or you have diabetes, or you have asthma or, or chronic, uh, pulmonary obstruction disease, and you want to take it voluntarily, it could save your life, but that's because it mitigates symptoms. It doesn't stop you from getting infected and it doesn't stop the spread. It was all nonsense. If someone's vaccinated and they get it, well, do they have fewer chances to spread because they're not coughing as much, for instance? No, no, no. Uh, first of all, that, you know, it, it, the virus goes where it wants, uh, you know, that that's, that, and that, that's exactly what we saw in December, 2021. But like I said, the evidence was plentiful before that. And by the way, this is going to have a huge impact. It is having a huge impact in China because uh, the vaccine for COVID is to get COVID. The way to be COVID is to get COVID. Survival rate is about 99.8%. Um, and you get it and you generate real uh, antibodies, effective antibodies, and your chance of getting it against not zero, but it's much lower. So the way you beat only, the way you beat COVID is by getting COVID. COVID is the vaccine for COVID. It's called herd immunity, it worked in the US, Brazil, uh, UK, and Europe. Now, the one major country that has not allowed that to happen is China. They've got this zero COVID policy, which makes no sense. You might as well say zero colds. You know, we're gonna we're gonna shut down cities of 26 million people at, at a time because somebody has a cold. That's what they're doing. I mean, I know I say it that way it makes it sound absurd, but it is absurd. But that's what they're doing. Now, um, 
in a communist society, you can do that. So they shut down Shanghai, 26 million people. I mean, if you get a couple of cases in a place like Shanghai, they shut down the neighborhood. They have COVID concentration camps. They move you out there. They, they physically, forcibly move you to, a, to one of these camps. Then if it's a little larger than that, like in a neighborhood or a whole building, they shut down that part of the neighborhood. And then beyond that, they shut down the entire city. Um, they have... Um, you have, you know, your iPhone, you have a QR code, it's, it's uh, red, yellow, green, uh, and they control it. They tell you what your code is. Um, you got to get tested once a week, if not more frequently. You cannot go outside. You cannot travel, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so they're like, we're going to beat it. Because you can't beat it, but they, they go through the pretense. So then they wake up one day and there's like, okay, four days in a row, no new cases. All right. So Shanghai is now reopening and they, you know, the Chinese stock market goes up because it's over. But then like three weeks go by and then it, you get a couple more cases and they do it again. So it's whack-a-mole at very, very high cost. And this will not change before the 20th National Party Congress in November at the earliest, because that's when uh, Chairman Xi will be anointed as the new Mao Zedong. He'll be the first president to get a third term, but de facto he'll be president for life. Xi Jinping thought with you know Chinese characteristics for a new age, as they call it, is, is the equivalent of Mao's Red Book. So they're doing everything possible to elevate him. He's not going to either admit he was wrong or change policy before then, at the earliest, maybe not even then. So, and, and China's going to show zero growth this year, zero. Yeah, or and that might even be fake. Like we know they're having major real estate collapses and and a lot of problems. But But China's an interesting thing because Let's say right now, you know, everybody's all the headlines are about inflation, but there's really two kinds of inflation. There's the monetary inflation from the Federal Reserve printing all this extra stimulus money, and there's the supply chain in, in, inflation where there's simply limited supplies of things, for instance, that were made in China. And when there's lower supply and demand remains the same, price goes up. So there's these two kinds of inflation. The Federal Reserve could really only handle one of them, which is the monetary inflation. They can really do very little on the supply side. And what's going to happen, you think? Well, uh, first of all, I, I agree that there are two sort I'll say two sources of inflation. One uh, you're you're right, James, the uh, you know, supply side, so-called uh, cost push inflation, um coming from you know energy shortages, supply chain disruption, uh, can't get fertilizer out of uh, Russia so we can't plant crops. Uh, we're diverting corn to supply diesel with higher, uh, you know, synthetic components of diesel. Well, that means there's not enough corn to feed the pigs and uh, and the cows, and so the price of meat goes up. So that's all connected. It's all falling apart. Comes from the supply side. The other side is called uh, demand pull inflation. It comes from individuals, and it's um, but there's no evidence that inflation expectations have anything to do with it. What, what does matter, and the Fed, it's just one more example of, of how the Fed is always wrong and they look at the wrong things. They do look at inflation expectations. People pull it and they gauge it. Uh, the, the best evidence is it has nothing to do with inflation. What does have to do with inflation are current expectations. You wake up in the morning, you decide, you see inflation all around you, and you say, well, you know, I was thinking of buying a refrigerator. I better go buy it now before the price goes up or a new car, or, uh, you know, suit of clothes or whatever. Um, I lived through that. That's what that's the way it was in the late 1970s. And that's the way we did things. We said, I better go buy it now because I know the price is going to go up. Um, and so but that's that's very real time. I mean, it's, it's and we're not there yet. We're not we're, we're dangerously close. And that feeds on itself, and it's very hard to break. Mon monetary policy has nothing to do with it. That's a myth, sort of launched by Milton Friedman. But there's no correlation. But, but, but no, but there, there's got to be there's got to be some truth to it. Like during these no. bailouts, there, there, there's people, there's no evidence there's no evidence for that. So okay. like no money somehow ended up with hundreds of thousands of dollars, and they finally bought the car they wanted to buy. They bought the clothes they wanted to buy. That's not monetary. That's not monetary policy. That's fiscal policy that came from the Congress. As far as monetary policy, so in 2008. The Federal Reserve balance sheet was $800 billion. And in 2014, at the end of the taper, it was $4.5 trillion. Okay, so the money supply went up by 400%, and there was no appreciable inflation that entire time. So there is no correlation between money supply, base money, and, um, and inflation. But, but could you argue that there was um, the money was used towards economic goods? So, so 
if money is put into the economy. It wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't. It was not. It was. But there's no evidence for that, James. I, I hear what you're saying. This is just warmed over Milton Friedman. And he was wrong about this. I'll tell, but I'll tell you why he was wrong. What he missed was velocity. In other words, you know, the quantity theory of money. But the guy who got it right was Irving Fisher. But it's, you know, it's money supply times velocity equals nominal GDP. And nominal GDP has two parts, a price index and um, and real. OK, that's the whole thing. So. Um, if, if Friedman and so Friedman said, and here's where he got it right. He said a modern industrial economy like the United States or a service economy, but a, a developed economy can really only grow about three and a half percent a year. And that's about right. You know, give or take it's, it's, if, if you have more than that, it's because you're coming out of a recession with some slack and yeah, you grow five, six percent per year, but that's, that's about it. Uh, you can do worse than that because of bad policy, but three and a half percent is about right. So, uh, and you don't want inflation. You want P, which is the price index, to be one. In other words, you don't want inflation or deflation in a perfect world. You want price stability. So, if, if a real can grow three and a half percent, and you want price inflation to be one, that means nominal grows three and a half percent. And then he went over to the other side of the equation. He assumed velocity was constant, and so he said, all you have to do is dial up the money supply or dial it down. You don't need a board of governors. You just need a computer to do that. And you can have nirvana, which is maximum growth, no inflation. Where Friedman was wrong was that velocity is not constant. It was during most of his career. I mean, to be fair, from 1950 to 1980, velocity was pretty constant. But you go back, you know, take the longer time series, look at the Great Depression, look at the 1920s, look at the aftermath of World War I, et cetera, or look at the last 10 years. Uh, velocity has collapsed. And so all of the Fed's money printing is, is okay, money supply is going up to offset the crash of velocity. Velocity looks like a Red Bull cliff dive. But part of velocity going down, and so by velocity, just a very simple explanation is, if I buy a newspaper from the newspaper guy with a dollar, he takes the dollar, buys a flower, the flower guy takes the dollar, buys a coffee, one dollar costs three dollars to be spent, that's Correct. velocity. And Correct. part of the collapse of, of velocity, though, has to do, and this happened, we could see this directly during COVID, has to do with the internet. Like money would arrive in an urban area, for instance, and immediately go to Seattle because people were buying stuff on Amazon. No one was buying things in stores. You're right. But that money is helicopter money from fiscal policy. That is not monetary policy. Here's how monetary policy works. When the Fed wants to increase the money supply, QE, let's say, they buy bonds from uh, primary dealers, right. or, which are the big banks. They call Goldman Sachs, offer me 10 year notes. Okay, done. Goldman delivers the 10 year note to the Fed, and the Fed pays for it with money from thin air. Okay. But what does Goldman or City, I don't pick on Goldman, JP Morgan, anybody else, what do they do with the money? They gave it back to the Fed as excess reserves. That money never entered the real economy. The only money that could enter the real economy is either commercial bank credit creation, which was very stale, very tame, or and I think this is really what you're referring to is fiscal policy. Those handouts made a big difference. You're right about that. The, the Trump, uh, June, June uh, 2020, Trump handed out the $1,400 checks. And then December 2020, just before he left office, there was a $600 check. And Biden comes in and says, I'll see your $1,400, raise your $1,400. He well, had also, a the corporate bailouts gave a lot of people who were Dead broke. I mean, there was so much scam during Correct. the corporate bailouts that that it by itself was trillions of dollars. Correct. No, you're absolutely right. But that was not monetary policy. That was fiscal policy. That was helicopter money. It was coming from the Congress. Well, with, with the monetary policy, though, what, what I worry about is when they're buying at the outer end of the curve. So they're not just buying like T-bills. They're buying, um, you know, 10-year mortgage uh, derivatives or, or even some have suggested they could have been buying stocks to keep to keep things going. Well, there's no evidence that they bought stocks, but um, as far as uh, yeah, tenure notes and mortgages and all that, you're right. But I run into people all the time, you know, like yourself. I'm you know speaker at conferences and all that. And people dying the tip. We got to stop the money printing. So the Fed's not printing money. The Fed's burning money right now. They they stopped. Um, I forget if it was QE six or QE seven. I lost track. But they stopped uh, increasing the money supply last November. They started decreasing the money supply, so called quantitative tightening, in March. Uh, and they are not, not only are they not buying securities, which is how they create money, uh, base money anyway, M0, they're, they're, um, they're selling securities. Which, and when you pay them for the securities, that money disappears. It's the opposite of QE. It's called QT. Uh, and then somebody, you know, it's, it's amazing how bad analysis is, you know, whether it's Bloomberg or all these guys. Somebody said, well, the Fed's not really doing QT because look at it. They didn't sell any securities. It's like they don't have to sell them. They just 
let them mature. Right, right. I, that's what that's what they said. Is that basically uh, starting June first, they were going to let the bonds mature, and then they just weren't going to buy anymore. If I if I have if I have a two year note that's two years old and it matures, the Fed just sends me the money. I don't have to sell it. And if you just do that and don't roll it over, that's the that's the key thing. Don't buy a new one. The balance sheet will shrink, and it is shrinking. So right now, the Fed is destroying money. They're not creating money. Uh, it doesn't matter because all that money didn't go anywhere anyway. It just went back to the Fed in the form of uh, excess reserves, and they were paying interest on excess reserves. That didn't do anything, but fiscal policy did. The, the Congress helicopter money under the the influence of modern monetary theory. I doubt there are two members of Congress who can tell you what modern monetary theory is, but it doesn't matter. They're all doing it. That is the 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 policy, the fiscal policy of the United States today, which is uh, MMT. And the Congress is still uh, helicoptering money down. Like, you know, they're considering forgiving $10,000 of student loan debt to the millions of people who have student loan debt. Like, that's a form of uh, helicoptering money down. Like, sure, it, it, we'll have a $100 billion to Ukraine that'll mostly be recycled to the Democratic Party. I mean, that's right. And then people don't realize that when a dollar is spent, even abroad, it has to, it could only come back here. You could only really spend a dollar back here. So if you give a hundred billion dollars to Ukraine, they have to spend the, the money eventually back here. That's right. First of all, a lot of the money, the money to Ukraine, I'll put that in quotes, doesn't even get spent. We, we pay Raytheon, you know, for weapons and we ship them to Ukraine sometimes uh, if they don't get diverted to the black market through Bulgaria in the meantime. But, you know, then the, the Ukrainian oligarchs have to buy new houses in Miami and Dubai and places like that. They've got to skim, you know, 20, 30 percent off the top. I was used to work in the Congo in in, in the, you know, the old days. The 30 percent skim was normal, except for Mobutu, who took 50 percent. But we used to actually price that into our we did jumbo loans. I was at Citibank at the time and we used to price that in. Um, but yes, yeah, so the Ukrainians are skimming or the money is going to Raytheon or, or North of Grumman before it even gets to Ukraine. We ship the weapons, the Russians blow them up and uh, you know wash, rinse and repeat. But uh, but that is real money. You're right. We're spending it at Raytheon. Somebody's getting a job out of it. I wonder what's going on now with the markets, you know, every market basically, is that I wonder if secretly the Federal Reserve realizes they can't do anything. For 10 years, they wanted to increase inflation. There was actually probably deflation before COVID. And they couldn't Correct. do it. They, they were, I, I asked a, a Fed Reserve governor, what's the one thing that keeps Powell up at night? The fact that there's probably deflation, like hidden deflation in the economy and not inflation. They were desperate for inflation, which is why they raised the target higher than 2%. Now there's right. runaway inflation. They don't know how it happened. And they know they, can't, they, they know they know nothing. So what my theory is, and I'm wondering if you agree with this, they're talking a mean game. They said there might be a hard landing. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. They've done basically almost nothing yet. And like you said, even what they do has no effect. And so, but, but their words have an effect on whether people buy stocks or not, or, or buy goods or not. And I wonder if what their, their plan is, is to reduce the wealth of the economy so much that that in itself stops inflation. So the stock market has gone down $10 trillion worth. Will that decrease in the nation's wealth reduce inflation? No, uh, there's very, first of all, there's very little evidence for the wealth effect. All these things that they teach you in economics. I, I actually struggled in economics when I was an undergraduate. I, mean, I got okay grades, but it wasn't my strongest subject. And I kept like, hey, what's wrong with me? I don't get it. I'm getting A's and everything else. I just don't get this. But it took me like 20 or 30 years to realize everything I was taught was garbage. And so I say, oh, well, once you understand you're being taught garbage, it makes sense that I didn't get it. But I kind of figured it out on my own. So uh, there is no wealth effect. The evidence for that is very, very weak. Uh, there's no correlation between money supply and inflation. The evidence for that is weak. Throw in velocity, yes. If you, your example, you know, the, the example you gave was velocity of three. One dollar creates three dollars of goods and services. The velocity thing is very important because velocity occurs the most in urban areas because that's where you could spend a dollar multiple times. So a it city can. like New York City or Chicago normally would have a high velocity effect. But with COVID, th this is why cities are essentially destroyed right now because cities lived off of velocity and they they made taxes they made all their revenues off of the velocity of money and mayors don't realize this i don't know how cities that are like new york city requires a hundred billion dollars to to run the city every year 
I don't know how they're going to ever make that kind of money again. There's zero velocity of money in, in cities now. Well, I, you're right about that, but they need to rely on Democratic presidents who are going to, you know, basically give them money, which is what, which is what's happened uh, in uh, the, the the original two trillion dollar bill that Biden did get passed. I forget the name of it, American Rescue Act or whatever it was. To, yeah, so he, he handed out some pretty big checks to New York and California, which is to be expected. Um, but uh, but yeah, again, it's really it, it's really important not to confuse asset inflation and price inflation. Because if I put money in the stock market, I bid up stocks and, you know, 100 million people do the same thing. You can get a stock bubble, but that's not velocity. That money's not, it's just, we're just trading stocks, right? But don't you think if people say, oh, my portfolio used to be worth 100,000, now it's worth 500,000. Don't you think that's going to make it easier for them to make a decision like, oh, I'm going to buy a house or I'm going to buy an a Tesla or whatever? Not not really. There's no, again, there's no evidence for that. They may or may not buy a house for a Tesla, but the the... The, uh, the I'm enough of a geek that I actually read these uh, uh, peer-reviewed uh, papers coming out of the economics profession. The funny thing about the Fed, the, the board of governors, and I know a lot of them, I know you do too. They're they're clueless, and the staff in Washington are pretty weak. They're caught up in uh, really flawed models. But if you go to the regional reserve banks, you know San Francisco, St. Louis, uh, New York to some, to a lesser extent, you can find some good research in some of these you know juniors and mid-level people. Uh, but They've shown again that the wealth effect is not is very weak. It's very attenuated. Um, and if if I buy assets, that's fine. And the asset goes up, I you know may I don't know maybe buy a bottle of champagne or something. But it really doesn't affect spending that much. What does affect spending is um, your confidence in the future. Inflation. If you think inflation is a driver, you will go out and spend more money, and that that feeds on itself. What about employment? What's the employment factor in inflation? Because usually the Fed gets nervous whenever unemployment's too low. Well, yeah, but they're, again, they've got it wrong because what they're ignoring is labor force participation. So the employment report came out Friday and uh, everyone looks at the unemployment rate. I don't, I mean, I, I, I see it, okay. But I look at the labor force participation, which went down again. And by the way, it's been going down for 10 years. Uh, it peaked at 70. It's never going to be 100. You know, there's good reason. Some people are not in the workforce. They're uh, they're homemakers or they're students or they're, you know, uh, there, there could be a lot of reasons for some. But uh, when it, uh, but it boomed uh, in the uh, 80s, 90s, mainly because women were entering in the early 2000s because women were entering the workforce, which is a good thing. But um but now it's collapsed. It's gone round numbers from 70 to 61. It's poking around 61, 62. Where are where, where is everybody? Like everybody says they since COVID, oh, we can't hire people anymore. There's nobody around. Like I whether I talk to hotels, restaurants, airlines, every industry, where did everybody go? Where is they all just moving with their parents? They're on the couch eating Doritos, living with their parents and watching NBA playoffs. I mean, they're uh the, the, you know, some of it's early retirement and, you know, and then so the, you know, the CNBC types are like, well, it's not really that people don't want to work this early retirement. It doesn't matter. I mean, yeah, okay, I'll buy that, but it doesn't matter if you're able-bodied, uh, I'm talking about uh, able-bodied individuals between the ages of 25 and 54. That's the prime workforce. There are approximately 10 million people in that category who are not in the labor force. And where are they? What, like, are they really just like, did they just cut all costs and they're doing nothing now? Like, what are they? Or are some they, are, you know, have, have working spouses. Some are living with their parents. Some are, you know, just coasting. Uh, some are <laughs> not extravagant lifestyles. Like you so, say, they're pro- let's say they cut corners then. Like, let's say now they went from a double income family to a single income. Yeah. Why is inflation up? Aren't they spending less? Well, no, we, inflation is up for the reason we mentioned, which is the supply side. This is not demand pull inflation. This is cost push inflation. It's coming from the supply side. Now, the, here's the danger. I mean, inflation is inflation. Price is going up. You know, if you got a Ford F-150, it, it, instead of $70 to fill up your truck, it's $150. And by the way, that's $80 less to take your spouse out to dinner uh, that weekend. So it's destroying demand uh, or, or consumer discretionary spending in other categories because you need, you know, uh, uh, that's the other thing with the employment report. You know, it's like, Wages up 5.1 percent. Everyone's like, "Hey, wages are up 5.1 percent. That's a nominal number, okay?" With 8.6 percent inflation, wages up 5.1 percent. Real wages went down 3.5 percent on an annualized basis. So real wages are going down once you adjust for inflation. And you have to put gas in your truck, and you got to put food on the table to some extent. And to the extent that costs more, and real wages are going down, which they are, then you have less for everything else. 
entertainment, travel, vacation, casinos, clothes, uh, you know, or tuition or, you know, some more valuable things. You just don't have the money. And that's why we're in a recession. You know, one of the questions I get, I do a lot of interviews and the question I get asked most frequently is, Jim, you know, do you think Fed policy is going to cause a recession? And uh, as recently as a few months ago, I said, well, actually I do. And I expect that late this year, maybe early next year. Let's watch for that. But now I just say we're in a recession. I mean, we're in it. First quarter GDP, that's in the books, down 1.6%. Second quarter GDP, the second quarter is over. We won't have the number till the end of July, but we have very good estimates from the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta and their GDP now. It's not perfect, but it's the best uh, forecasting tool I've seen. And as of now, with the quarter over, but not quite all the data in, they're showing uh, negative one9 for the second quarter. Well, and let me let me ask so, you this. So because, that's, that's two consecutive quarters. You're, yeah. you're in the recession right now. And this is getting into the weeds a little bit, but do you think GDP is a, a good measure or is a better measure GDI, gross domestic income, which is actually what we make as a country as opposed to the value of what we produce? Well, uh, then you have to get into, you know, look, there are other measures. Yeah, uh, GDI, um, you know, the French have developed a... Uh, uh, well-being or happiness metrics. Right. Well, that, that's like a BS metric though, but like GDI is actually what humans are making. Like that's our income as a country. Well, yeah. So uh, real or nominal, I mean, again, you have to adjust for inflation and, uh, you know, you have to also adjust for jobs. I mean, if you're putting the, all the jobs overseas or you also have to look at it on a per capita basis. I was in a uh, um, I, was, I was talking to Saki Kibarasan, I don't know if you remember him, but he was, he was deputy, uh, finance minister of Japan during the 80s. He was he was known as Mr. Yen. That was his nickname. Um, and I said, we were, we were having lunch in Korea, and I said, hey, you know, Saki Barasan, you know, Japan, Japan has had eight recessions uh, since 1989. They have. And uh, net deflation, a little inflation here and there, but really not much and not much growth, just kind of flatlining. It's really a long depression is the best way to describe it. Yeah, but meanwhile, the debt to GDP ratio is like, approaching 300 uh, percent he goes to Rickerson. he said you have to understand those are all gross numbers but when you do it on a per capita basis we're actually doing much better and he was right of course i knew that i knew that the population was declining and so that their per capita numbers look better than their gross numbers because the population is declining so i said uh so i said so they <laughs> So where this ends up is that there's one person left in Japan and they own the whole country. He's the richest guy in the world. Now that was the reductio ad absurdum, but that's that's one way of thinking about economic growth. And uh, yeah, I agree there are other ways to measure it. Some are better than others, but uh, uh, I always, uh, you know, it's like the inflation hawks. Um, this guy, John Taylor, I guess he he does, you know, real, he has, he has an alternate measure of inflation that shows it's much higher than the government says. And it's good. I mean, I look at this research. I'm like, yeah, okay, that's that's not a bad way to think about it. But the Fed doesn't care. If you're trying to forecast policy, and you're trying to say what the Fed's going to do and the impact that's going to have on markets, whether you agree or not, you have to look at the metrics the Fed is looking at. Otherwise, you're not going to. You got to put yourself. And this is this is how you do intelligence analysis. You got to put yourself in the other guy's shoes. It doesn't take your opinion, put it to one side. Take your biases, put those to the other side, put yourself in the other guy's shoes and figure out what he's going to do. If you're trying to forecast, then get back to reality and figure out what's going to happen next. Fed doesn't care about John Taylor. They look at, uh, uh, you know, well, they look at PCE uh, deflator core. But uh, yeah, I, I agree there are other ways to measure it. And uh, But the other problem with uh, GDI is uh, income distribution is, you know, we make Mexico look like an egalitarian society. It's, you know, the old joke, I'm sure you've heard it, uh, you know, 50 guys in a bar and Bill Gates walks in and on average, everyone's a billionaire. Well, that's a true statement, but it didn't mean everyone else got richer. You know, that's a, that's a good point. And so, so again, what do you think, like right now, the markets have been going down since November. Is that because of the, this, quant I mean, and you're, you're alluding that it's not the quantitative tightening, it's kind of the supply shocks that have been hitting the economy post COVID and, and also the war with Ukraine. Again, the Fed really has nothing to do with anything, but they're right. but they're talking a mean game. And I feel like the market has been affected by the Federal Reserve's talk, and that has reduced the wealth of the country. But you're saying the wealth effect doesn't really affect inflation. It's it's more these supply shocks that we're going through right now. So 
if velocity is the key explanatory variable in the quantity theory of money, then you go to the next level and say, okay, what affects velocity? And the answer is psychology. Going back to your velocity three example, if I'm feeling good and I go out to dinner tonight and drinks on me and uh, you know I'm spending money left and right, that's one state of the world. But if I'm staying home watching TV, keep my money in the bank, my velocity is zero in that example. I always remind people, uh, people worry about the money supply. I go, well, uh, you know, where I went to school, seven trillion times zero is zero. If you don't have velocity, you don't have an economy. And, and my guess is the velocity, and, and maybe you could tell me this is not correct, does velocity at all correlate to the markets? Like if the stock market loses 25% of its value, I have to think drinks aren't on me anymore for the average person. So there must be some effect on velocity. It can be. I mean, that's a good example. The simplest way to put it, it's psychological. So what affects psychology? Well, the answer is a lot of things. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it could be, uh, I woke up, you know, and uh, first news I headline is, you know, the former prime minister of Japan's assassinated. Uh, people were saying Abe. I'm like, who's Abe? I mean, I know who you know, Shinzo Abe is, of course, but I'm thinking it sounds Middle Eastern. I, was, I couldn't, I was shocked that it happened in Japan. That doesn't happen in Japan. But of course it did, sadly, uh, with a homemade gun. That's another, we don't have to get into gun control, but you know, people want guns, they'll make their own. But um, uh, so uh, that, you know, that that's, you get shocks like that and uh, people get a little, you know, between, crime in the big cities, um, you know, the, the surrender in Afghanistan, the Russians are winning in Ukraine. That's very clear. I don't know who's going to break that to the American people. You read the New York Times, you would think that the Ukrainian flag is flying over Moscow. But if you read, uh, you know, if you look at Telegraph and, you know, some retired military officers have been pretty candid. Um, the Swiss actually are a good source because they're a lot of, a lot of, the thing about people don't understand about Switzerland, everybody has a machine gun under his bed. Like the whole country is armed. Every parking lot in Switzerland is a bomb shelter. They haven't been invaded in 500 years. And there's a reason for that. But um, but they do volunteer retired military in Switzerland, which is basically the whole country volunteers peacekeepers. So they which is not an easy job. You, you know, you're you're between two warring armies trying to keep a lid on things. So, uh, so some of the Swiss you know, retired colonels are, have been peacekeepers on, in uh, eastern Ukraine and, and other hairy areas. They know what they're talking about. So there are some good sources out there, but you really have to look for them. But Russia's winning. They're winning on the ground and they're winning the economic war. Um, and I did, uh, a, a, not all, but a lot of what I did for the intelligence community involved financial warfare. That was my, they didn't need me to jump out of a helicopter with a knife between my teeth, but they needed financial expertise. And that's what I did. So I know a lot about. Like, what would they have you do? Well, uh, you know, basically financial warfare. We did it. We did a war game. But I, I did a lot with a, a group uh, called Cepheus. Uh, and you say Cepheus, and people go, "Does that you know itch or burn?" But uh, it's uh, it's it stands for the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. So it is an interagency committee it's hosted at the Treasury, and um, they they get to look at foreign acquisitions of U.S. companies not from an antitrust or other point of view, but from a national security point of view. And you can say no to them, you know, depending on all the facts. Well, the Treasury, the Treasury, uh, Defense Department, State Department, Commerce are the, are the main inputs. There's some other agencies involved, but they outsource the national security review to the intelligence community. The intelligence community can't say yes or no, but they report back, you know, is this a, a hostile buyer? Is it a, are they, uh, you know, is it, is it a, covert operation of some sort, um, is there a threat to national security, what, et cetera. So that's the work I did, but I, you know, a front row seat in terms of that whole process. But my my point being, um, when uh, Wally Adeyamo, uh, he's, he's the deputy secretary of the treasury in charge of saying, Janet Yellen has no clue. Janet Yellen is, she's a, you know, high IQ statistics geek from Berkeley. You know, she, she knows nothing about the economy, but this guy, Wally Adeyamo, who, has never had a real job. He, um, you know, he's got the usual Yale, Harvard diplomas and all that, you know, like credentialism, but uh, worked as a junior in the National Security Council. And then he carried Larry Fink's briefcase for a year. And then he was president of the Obama Foundation. Now he's deputy secretary of the treasury. Um, he knows how to throw on sanctions and he's throwing them on left and right. Every single one of them has backfired. And I, I, get, I teach financial warfare at the US Army War College. Uh, and uh, I said to my class, um, I was there at uh, end of April, beginning of May, uh, down in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. I said, uh, all these sanctions are going to fail. 
they're they're already failing, but you know they're going to get worse. So let me. How, how, how do you measure failing? Well, for example, I'll, I'll give you a concrete example. So so Biden said we're going to seize all the oligarch assets, but and Boris Johnson was worse. But um, we're going to seize all the oligarch assets. So we're seizing yachts, we're seizing townhouses in Belgravia, you know, freezing bank accounts, et cetera, as if that's going to punish the Russians. What they don't understand is that Putin's base of support. It's the uh, military, intelligence community, the Orthodox Church, and everyday people. That's his base. He hates the oligarchs. He considers the oligarchs to be a rival power center. Now, he told them, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, he said, uh, he put a couple in jail, just as an example to the rest. But he said, you can keep your money, but keep out of politics. And if you go into politics, you're going to end up in jail or worse or dead. Uh, he doesn't mess around. So that was the deal, but he doesn't like oligarchs. He considers them rivals. So we're doing his dirty work for him. Is he would love to seize all those assets. Well, we're doing it for him. And by the way, guess guess what the oligarchs are doing? They're bringing capital back to Russia because that's the new safe haven if you're a Russian oligarch. So that's um, that's a favor to Putin. He should send Biden a thank you note. Uh, Russian revenues for oil and natural gas are at all time highs. The ruble, everyone's like, oh, it's back where it was before the war started. No, it's stronger than before the war started. But the, when the war started, it was about 80 to 1. It dipped to 140 for about a minute, rallied back to 80. Today, it's like, I think it was like 65 bids, 67 offered or something. I mean, it's 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 actually getting too strong. My my friend, uh, Avira Nabulina, she's, uh, she's the head of the Central Bank of Russia. She's the only central banker in the world who knows her job, knows how to run a central bank. She's going to cut interest rates because she's got to weaken the ruble a little bit because it's now getting a little too strong. Uh, uh, you know, Russia now has um, a monopoly on Ukrainian grain. Uh, so big, you know, there's a big upper. Russia's stealing the grain from Ukraine and selling it to Syria. Well, they were, but that's what happens in a war. When you win, you get to keep stuff. I mean, what? Why is why is that shocking? Oh, so Russia took over like a third of Ukraine. They captured a lot of Ukrainian grain and farms. And they're selling it to their allies and Syria being number one. Why is that a surprise? It's called war. That's how wars work. When, you know, the Israelis, everyone's like, why don't you get back to territory? Well, no, Israelis won four wars and they get to keep stuff. So this, this notion that you're stealing the grain, it's called booty. I mean, if, if you know, or whatever you want to call it, but it comes as no surprise. And by the way, everyone's like, oh, Russia's only got a third of Ukraine. It may be a third of the territory, but it's close to 100 percent of the industrial capacity, with the exception of Odessa. All the steel, the steel plants, uh, the mining, uh, energy generation, uh, the port facilities, the, all that stuff is in the in the strip, the land bridge from Russia to Crimea that the that the Russians have captured. So it may be a third of the land, but it's as I say, closer to 70, 80 percent of the economic capacity of the country. What's going on? Like I, they recently defaulted on on some of their debt. Like what was going on with that? Well, a really good question. So that's that's the fine default. So they didn't pay. Okay, so that's a default. You know, technically they wanted to pay. They had the money, but we wouldn't let them. We closed the payment channels. Okay, so they couldn't. All right, and that's that is a technical default. So tell me who wins. So I, you know, last time I looked, if I'm if I'm the debtor and you tell me I don't have to pay you, I was like, well, thank you very much. I get to keep the money. Who loses? The creditors. Who are the creditors? Well, BlackRock. I mean, got any uh, Russian bonds in your emerging market CTF that was sold to you by Federated or Fidelity or Goldman or BlackRock? Take a look. You know, it might be in there. But in, in other words, the winner is the debtor who gets to keep the money. And the loser is the creditor who owns the bond that didn't get paid. So this is another a good, good question, James, but another example of how we're hurting ourselves. All of our sanctions are not hurting Russia. They are hurting us. It's, now, the supply chain was breaking down before the war in Ukraine. And uh, prices were going up, particularly in the energy sector, before the war in Ukraine. Uh, but Ukraine, is, the war is making it worse. There's, there's no question about that. What's actually happening then? So the Fed is not doing anything, but they are talking the stock market down. Stock market's going down, which I do think decreases velocity, but we'll see. And, and, and I'm hoping that the decrease in velocity will decrease inflation. So my theory is the Federal Reserve is talking inflation down because they know they can't actually do anything. 
in addition to all the supply stuff going on. If inflation goes down a couple, like let's say we see in two or three months, the numbers are down because there's a recession, because the stock market's down, whatever, the Fed will kind of loosen their language a little bit and that will be a positive thing for the markets. That's my overall simplified theory. Well, uh, that's like saying, um, you know, uh, I'm going to hit myself in the head with a hammer because it feels good when it stops. I mean, I, I agree. That is that, what they're doing. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. So um, you said the Fed can't stop inflation. Well, the Fed can't do anything about the supply side. You're right about that. I agree. They don't drill. For, last time I checked, they don't drill for oil. They don't drive tractors. They don't drive trucks. They don't unload cargo in Long Beach and they don't pilot you know, container cargo vessels across the Pacific. So they, the Fed can't do anything about the supply side, what's called cost push inflation. They can fight inflation one way, which is to utterly destroy demand. If, and this is what Paul Walker did in 1980, 81. You raise interest rates enough, mortgage rates go up, asset values go down, unemployment goes up, people are laid off, we're in a recession or worse, you know, maybe it tips into a financial panic. It's another subject, but there's a whole global liquidity crisis going on behind the curtain that very few people understand. Uh, but that's that may emerge, which is separate from the uh, from the recession. So yeah, you destroy the economy, cause a severe recession, uh, bordering on depression level statistics, and inflation will go down. I agree with that. And in that world, the Fed will cut rates, but at what cost? I mean, what? what just, just listen to what we just said. Yeah, I can get inflation under control by destroying it. I mean, Paul Volcker did it. That 1981-82 recession was, at the time, the worst recession since the Great Depression. Now, we've, right. managed, we've managed to surpass that since then, but at the time, that was the worst. And, and, and I agree. Volcker was like a maniac with what he was doing. He had like one hammer and everything was a nail. Right. But I, my, my thinking now is that the Fed knows nothing works. Like even Volcker style raising rates, you'd have to raise rates that high to have any effect at all. So my thinking is the Fed wants to manipulate psychology more than actual money. Like, why would Powell say things like, we might have a hard landing? Like, the Fed never used to talk like that. They never used to predict right. landings. They would be as quiet as possible, and they would raise or decrease rates. Now they're, like, commenting. And the reason, my think is they're, they're commenting because they want people to be depressed so that they stop buying and inflation goes down. Yeah, you're right, and that is the old playbook. Um, what do they call? It? They used to call it forward, or well, they still call it forward guidance, um, uh, jawboning. You know, a lot of a lot of names for it. You, yeah, you're right about that. With one big difference, which is, if it's demand driven, if it's demand pull inflation, if it's behavioral, then maybe jawboning and threatening bad things, and we're going to raise rates until this economy slows down. Maybe that works, but that's not what's happening. That's not where the inflation is coming from. Again, I see. Jawboning job job does not unclog the port of Los Angeles. So, so you're right. So what you're describing essentially is the 70s. You're describing stagflation, which is inflation caused by supply. And everybody would love to buy, but now they don't even want to buy. And, but there's still inflation. Right. Well, but the 70s had two phases. Phase one is, is the phase we're in now. That was the Arab oil embargo. Then in 79, you had the Iranian oil embargo. That was supply driven. That was, that was cost push. But it morphed into uh, demand pull. It morphed into behavioral changes in higher velocity. And the danger right now is that we've got the first one. The supply chain is messed up, cost push inflation, it's everywhere. It hasn't quite morphed to behavior because, because people are, they hate it, they don't like it, they know it's there, but they're kind of like, ah, you know, maybe it'll go away. <laughs> well, and they're depressed. They don't want to spend money. <laughs> well, that's right. That's that's exactly right. You see that in the velocity. The question is, does it persist long enough so that there is that you cross what physicists call the um, you know the critical threshold or phase transition, where somehow there's there's a catalyst and the demand uh, pull inflation, the behavioral adaptations emerge. It hasn't happened yet, but it could. So you got to keep an eye on that. And then that would be a full full replay of the uh, of the 1970s, Act 1 and Act 2. Um, but I agree that the Fed's trying to talk it down, they, but it won't work. And here's why. Because it's coming from the supply side. And, you know, again, oil, someone not investing in the oil field because Biden's saying we're going to shut down oil in five years. Okay, I got a 10 to 15 year horizon on my investment, but you're going to shut it down in five years. I, I think I'll pass. Thank you. Uh, so that has nothing to do with the Fed, but um, but so so the Fed's talking it down. It won't work. But if you raise interest rates enough, it will work. 
but at a, as we described, at a very, very high cost. You'd have to raise, and that's the whole ludicrous thing about 50 basis points or 75, you have to raise like a thousand basis points for it to affect inflation. <laughs> You're right, we have, the, we have the data. So basically round numbers, real rates, real rates have to be about 2% to subdue inflation and slow the economy. So with inflation at 8.6, that means your nominal rate has to be 10.6. Which it hasn't been since Volcker. Correct. And, and so, so you know, 10.6 nominal, uh, 8.6 inflation, your real rate is two. That'll slow it down. Well, you're not going to get to 10.6. You're not going to get to 5.6. We'll be in the worst recession since, uh, well, worse than 2008. That's where we'll be before you get to five. I, I I agree, but I don't think I, I don't think they want to raise rates that much. I, I think that's why they're trying to jawbone it, as you say. And but but well, I, I I agree with what they're doing, James. I agree with that description. But it will, all I'm saying is it'll fail. So so I'm wondering if they're just biding time because eventually the supply shocks caused by COVID will will relax. I mean, maybe they won't, but it's it just things have a tendency to get better. Uh, you know, when the conditions that cause them stop. And eventually this war will be over. So that supply shock will be over. Like could just natural events kind of ease this cost push inflation? No, because um, I, but I just read a book on this. It's coming out November 29th. The book's called Sold Out. Uh, it's available for pre-order on Amazon, but it's a it's a really deep study on the supply chain. And, and I, I look at, um, uh, and I, basically I talked to the guy who built the supply chain, the number one guy. Like it, nobody did this sold, but this guy had more, He's recognized in academia and government as like the man who built the supply chain. And he said to me, um, he said, Jim, you have to understand, it took us 30 years to build it. We blew it up in three years. It's not coming back in less than five or 10 years, at, at least, if not longer. In other words, this is this is Humpty Dumpty, you know, it breaks, but you can't put it back together. You can hatch a new egg over here, but that's that will take five to 10 years. So the, the answer is uh, no. Um, there's nothing the Fed can do about the supply chain. By the way, COVID played a role, but this, this if you really want to, I, I did do this research and I had very good sourcing. Um, the supply chain really started to break down in 2018 with the trade war. It was really Trump's trade war and the tariffs on China. Now, I don't want to debate tariff policy. I, I happen to agree with it. But if you want to say, okay, when did uh, uh, shipping start to slow down? When did uh, the ports start to get congested, et cetera? It wasn't COVID, it was the trade war. And and things like China fighting back by saying we're not buying any more U.S. soybeans. Okay, well, where are you going to get your soybeans? They bought them from Brazil. Brazil is the second largest producer after that. Brazil, Canada, and the U.S. are the three largest producers. Well, okay, but that's not like picking up a phone and saying, hey, send me some soybeans. You've got transportation lanes, shipping channels that they built for 20 years. And the parties to that, like five, 10-year contracts, they don't do it on a, on a phone call. And so... Transferring all those lanes to Brazil from the West Coast of the United States took years. But once you do it, here's my point. Once you do it, you don't flip back. They're just going to keep buying soybeans from Brazil. So, um, so these and, and with more costs involved because of uh, because of all the frictions and what I just described. And so that stuff is doesn't turn on a dime. You can't break it and and rebuild it very easily. And it had nothing to do with COVID. So the answer is it's going to persist, and it is. So what's next? What's next is, um, uh, and this goes by different names. I, I write about it in my new book in the conclusion. Uh, Janet Yellen has, calls it friendshoring, and uh, Macron calls it, uh, he has some name for collegiality or, or something. But, but the point is, we're still going to have supply chains. We're still going to have extended supply chains. Nobody can be autarkic, or at least not very efficiently. But they're going to be confined to groups of friends. So liberal democracy. So China will be cut out, will be decoupled. So Australia, the US, Canada, Western Europe, UK, you know, South Africa, New Zealand, another set of countries um, can trade with each other because they'll uphold, they won't have slavery, they won't have genocide, they'll uphold some liberal democratic values, you know, small d democrat. And then China will have to go figure out their own supply chain with whatever you know dictatorships uh, they can find. But we're not going to do business with China, which you know supports organ harvesting uh, from live patients without anesthetic, who happen to be political enemies, killing 20 million girls with bedside buckets who drowned at birth, uh, slavery, genocide, 
uh, you know, again, I work hard not to buy, you know, Nike shoes, for example. And I agree with you on, on China. Everything you say about China, 100%. I did a podcast with uh, General Spalding, who was a, a top China advisor in the last administration, and he's he says the same things. Uh, my question is, are we dependent on China for anything? For instance, rare earth minerals. They are the largest source of rare earth minerals. We need rare earth minerals to power our grid, to 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 turn on any semiconductor, you need rare earth minerals. What happens if they say, hey, we're just not selling you those anymore? It's fine. I mean, first, first thing about rare earths, rare earths are not rare. Uh, they're, called, they're called rare earths because when you mine them, the, the density is low. There's like just a little bit in whatever ton of ore, but they're everywhere. So uh, basically we'll have to expand our, our rare earth mining capacity. And there's tons of, we got all we need in Colorado. But try getting past the you know the green new scamsters. I mean that that's the problem. We've got all the energy we need. We got all the rare earths we need. We got all the hydro we need. We got everything we need. I'm not I'm not arguing for no uh, extended supply chains. I think we'll have that as, as along the lines I described. We don't. But but if you ask, are we in fact dependent on China today? The answer is yes. Do we have to be going forward? The answer is no. Um, by the way, it's a very good report on this, and I, I mentioned my book sold out. Um, Called the there's a group called the Five Eyes. I'm sure you know who they are. Uh, the Five Eyes are five countries that uh, are close enough that they actually share intelligence. Intelligence agencies don't like to share with each other. But uh, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, um, U.S., and the U.K. They're the Five Eyes. And again, it's an intelligence you know condo if you want to think of it that way. But they've kind of branched out, and there's some there's a new report, uh, but it's all. It's all on trade dependency. Uh, and I, I just call it the Five Eyes Report. It has, has some technical name, but it's, it's a footnote in my book. But I, I write about it a lot. And uh, so they did a study. They took f- approximately 5,400 product categories from some standardized indices and uh, uh, of um, you know, kind of taxonomies of products. They then looked at uh, where they came from, who, who produced them and who bought them. And they set a couple uh, parameters. They said, okay, do you get um, more than 50% of this from the sole supplier? And does that sole supplier produce more than 80% of the global output? They, they set a couple of parameters that define dependency for this purpose. And then they ran the numbers. And it was shocking. The results were shocking. Uh, don't get a hangover in New Zealand. They get 100% of their aspirin from China. Uh, but on a more serious note, you know, laptop computers, um, so yeah, all our pharmaceuticals uh, come from China, don't they? A great deal of them. Absolutely right. Penicillin, aspirin, a lot, a lot else. So, uh, but, but, but the thing I liked about it was that it was rigorous, empiric, data-driven and, and quantifiable, but they, they showed, uh, it, what was interesting is the UK was a little less dependent, but Australia, New Zealand, United States, all heavily dependent on China for these goods. And so, but the good thing about it, it gives you a target set. It tells you what you need to onshore or friendshore. You know, I don't have to make it in the United States, but I better make it in Australia or Canada. Uh, although Canada's going fast just pretty quickly, but uh, you have to uh, work with your friends, not with your enemies. And I think that's the way to put it. Jim, it's it's fascinating to hear your insights. You know so much, and I've already been taking notes on like which authors to read and which books to read. But how can people find you and read? You know, you write articles on a very frequent basis. How do people sign up for you? Thank you. My flagship newsletter is called Strategic Intelligence. It's a great value. It comes out once a month. It's about five thousand words, so I put a lot into it. But it's a very attractive price point. But uh, if you just Google, you know, James Rickard Strategic Intelligence, you'll find it. some Paradigm Press. Uh, they're my publisher. I have some other specialized newsletters. Uh, you, you believe me, you'll get an email about those. But uh, the strategic intelligence is our, our pride and joy. That's our flagship. And I have a new book coming out, uh, Sold Out. Uh, it's available for pre-order on Amazon. Will you come on again when uh, when Sold Out comes out? I would love to. That'll be uh, that'll be October, November. Would love to come back. Excellent. Well, thanks so much, Jim, for joining us. I mean, you, you've explained a lot. I things, understand things a lot better. And look, I always hope for the best. I always tell people if there's a good company that's innovating and creating things, there's nothing wrong with investing it. Don't try to game the entire market. The market as a whole has so many factors and and a lot of them are are scams that I don't trust it. But look, I'm nervous about the economy and and inflation and so on. I don't think anybody knows what they're doing. And it's refreshing to hear your your insights into this. I, I learned a lot. Thank you.